This is Two Minutes About Time with Luke Allen and Robert E. G. Black, the podcast that takes a look at the film About Time, two minutes at a time. I am Richard Curtis, and I hope you enjoy it. And if you don't, well, you can just travel back in time two minutes and listen to something else. I'm one of your hosts, Luke Allen, joined as always with my co-host, Robert E. G. Black. Hello. And joined once again for this week with my former film teacher, Kate. Hello. So today we're looking at minutes 93 and 94 of About Time, which opens with the continuation of Mary trying on the different dresses. <laughs> well, it opens with her first trying on another dress, which is the purple one. Yep. She opens with, what about this? Tim says, gorgeous, we did it. She says, oh no, it's too breasty. She's right. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> Mary says, okay. And then she comes out with a new dress, which is, you know, a lot more formal and serious. And Tim just says, it's not too breasty. She says, no, I'm not wearing these heels. I look like a prostitute. <laughs> well, not high heels then. And then uh, she says, but then we have the short legs problem. So Tim responds, well, do you want to look like a prostitute or a dwarf? Uh, Which was Donal's ad lib line. <gasps> That's I love awesome, the first warning. Great it's great. So I assume that means that Mary's response is also yes. ad libbed. But yeah, I forgot to say last week, that this is one of the only scenes in the film where they actually use two cameras. So yeah, huh. I think it works better. And this was... Th- this scene was the first time Donald saw each of the dresses. <laughs> so I guess it definitely helps with all of that. And actually, it's, uh, it's quite a good follow-up to the discussion we had last week with Darren when he was joking about doing the different scenes and changing costume quickly because mm-hmm. this is literally what this entire scene is. Yeah, she just goes out, changes, and comes back. Cut out the boring part. And I guess, as we talked last week about the whole male presentation of the film and being from Tim's point of view, what do we think of this whole dress exchange is it over comedic is it over stereotyped i i think it's so relatable i really do i mean i'm i'm not that woman and i don't like shopping and all of those typical female things but i think i've been the person sat in the chair with friends thinking just pick an outfit nobody (laughs) cares they're all going to be drunk just just get dressed and let's go and you can see in, in him, he's getting more and more dishevelled yeah. by the minute and slightly more desperate as the time goes on. And she's, you know, and while he's kind of unravelling, her confidence is building bit by bit. And there's kind of that contrast again, which I, I, I really, really like. But I think, you know, the male audience, and I'm speaking from a female perspective, so maybe I'm not one to talk, but... I think a lot of them will be able to to relate. Um, and I think that from a female point of view, you know, it's highlighting that this quite lovely character has got a lot of insecurities and can get nervous and doesn't take everything in her stride. And, you know, she's been a mum and she's already made a reference previously, like we discussed in the last episode, to I don't want to do that again, I got so fat. And now she's trying to get herself into a dress and and feel good and look good and be professional and be everything that she was before children. And that's a huge, huge thing for her. And he's downplaying it with humour or being dismissive. So you've got that kind of neither of them can win in that scenario. But yeah, I I personally think it, I don't think it's overplayed. I think it's done just enough for it to become funny rather than uncomfortable. And I think it is odd for a film, which obviously is from the male perspective, I, I debated to say you have to win the male audience more with a film like this because a rom-com is typically the film that, you know, the woman brings the guy to go and see. So stuff like this and, and obviously the father son relationship, which is in the center of the film. But I, I, I think it's rare. I know I'm in the minority of blokes who pick up the film and go, I want to watch this film. You know, it's a very female targeted film, which given the contents of the film, I completely disagree with. I think it's. I think it's been unfairly considered your average rom-com when it's got so much more in it. But I I assume it's a marketing decision with knowing that Love Actually and Notting Hill and all of that, if you can guarantee that audience, then you'll succeed. But possibly, as we discussed uh, the other week, that audience had already grown up by the time this film came out, hence it didn't do so well. (laughs) But yeah, I I think it's, it's good that scenes like this are able to sort of satirize slightly that aspect of life you know and make 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 it over comedic because i don't know what i'm saying i lost that but hopefully that makes sense yeah (laughs) 
I, I, I think it's a setup as well, isn't it? It's part of that setup, like from the last episode. We're leading up to the, the destruction, the, the revelation, the, the fall and, and things going wrong on, on lots of levels. Yeah. Mm. Um, and it, it's something very mundane and day to day and what am I going to wear and how do I feel about this? And it has that everyday aspect to it whilst adding that bit of tension so that you, you feel that tension which is really important in the next kind of minute, minute and a half. I mean, from a, um, as I say, I'm, I'm not male, <laughs> but you know, I'm not a rom-com fan. We didn't pick this up because it was a rom-com. We picked it up. It was like, oh, time travel. And we were going through a, a kind of phase of watching different time travel films. And we knew it wasn't science fiction. And I was like, I'll watch anything with Bill Nye in. I'm good. Let, let's watch. But you wouldn't have got me as a female, possibly with a slightly more kind of male taste in film, to have gone, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll watch that because it's a nice love story. So I think you've got a good point there in terms of, yes, it, it has male narration, and yes, it's from the male point of view, but it, it does have to work harder to get a male audience to engage. And I think unless that male audience is or has certain themes in their own life that they can see in the film they might not engage at all to to be honest you know if it wasn't for the father son thing going on if it wasn't for the fact that we are now parents and we've got a little one or you know ours was about four at the time of watching this i probably would have dismissed it but actually it is a good film but i yeah i think it has to have something relatable in for those male members of the audience the only appeal for me really was the fact that it was a Richard Curtis film. If it was another writer, another director, I wouldn't have cared. The fact that I knew this is the guy who wrote my favourite Doctor Who episode, who wrote Blackadder, Mr Bean, Four Weddings, which is debatably not a rom-com anyway. But <laughs> that, that's a whole different route. But yeah, it, it was enough that I knew his track record and that I liked it. But I think if it were a, a different rom-com, a different director, and had the same style marketing, I would have dismissed it and missed out on this entirely. So Mary comes in. Tim says yes, very excitedly, and Mary says no and immediately leaves. And he checks his watch, um, which is what makes this scene work for me. Because I, I think the woman trying on the dresses is a scene that's been in a lot of romantic comedies, and comedies in general. And so it feels a little overplayed to me. But then I think it works because it slows down time when we just had a two-year jump in the movie. And so it's it's nice to see Tim having to slow down, and here he even checks his watch because this is taking too long. Yeah, it, it focuses on the minutia of, of the everyday yeah. and that we get trapped and caught up in. But what I really liked about this change scene, because you are right, it's overdone and it's in so many films from, from teen flicks to, to mm-hmm. rom-com to, I was watching Eat, Pray, Love the other day and there's one in the changing rooms in there. What I did like about this one in comparison is that there is no focus on her getting changed. We don't True. see the, pulling up the jeans or the doing the zip or the, you know, the over the shoulder shots while she's getting changed and talking from the changing room. So some of those stereotypical genre conventions for that particular cliche wasn't used. And I, I, I liked that because it made it more subtle. Again, it was about the dialogue and the small gestures like the looking at the watch and, and what that moment signified more than it was on the I suppose objectification of the female form yeah because and we're looking at it from his perspective if he can't see her get changed then we as the spectator don't see her get changed we're not Mm -hmm. given that gratification which is so overplayed normally so I just thought that was quite a conscious choice yeah they've been quite careful as to avoid anything like that of Mary Mary, in the film which I think is mostly just to juxtapose what we get of Charlotte Mm -hmm. Because when, when we meet Charlotte, Margot Robbie's character at the start of the film, we, we start on her legs and move up afterwards. And obviously one of the only scenes we got with her, she's in pyjamas, she's in a bikini, and it's all glorified yeah. and over the top with her. That we then meet Mary for the first time in the dark. So we already learn to like her character, hopefully, before we know what she looks like. Yep. I think it also shows the maturation of him as a male character. You know, that hormonal kind of, 
late teen, early twenties, or I can't remember specifically what age he is, but that kind of young man who is so desperate for love, attention and or sex and will look at anything that's remotely hot and just lust for it and long for it. And actually, you know, it, it seems quite obvious the contrast between the two, but the depth from Mary there is really important that we don't have that same thing. But I, I do think it, it plays into, like you say, he doesn't age physically, does he, throughout yeah. the entire thing. So we need clues like that to show where we are on his his journey, I suppose. I think it's also important that when we have the... when We, we refer to it as the sex scene, although the, the main point is the fact that we don't see anything either. It's, it makes them... I think it makes it more intimate, them together, the fact that we as the viewer don't see any of it and i think it, i think that that is a a thing which so many films don't do <laughs> that especially rom-coms you know you've always got so many seem to have you know the sex scene or the awkward sex scene where something goes wrong that actually it, it we, we just cut ahead and i think that's it, it makes it so much better and makes us see mary as a person and not as a sexual object and so she then uh comes out wearing a very a horrible, horrible dress at this point, which Richard Curtis says he thinks might have been a step too far. But Rachel McAdams has said, yes, dresses like that do exist. <laughs> Is that the silver yeah. looking number? With, yeah. Yeah. They do. I've seen plenty of people out in them. They, they were quite high fashion about 10 years ago. But no, they're not very flattering at all. Mm. And Tim obviously instantly says no to that one. And then... Uh, then she comes out in the black slip, and Tim says, now that I like. She says, uh, no, I'm just picking up the dress that this goes under. Such a bad boy. I mean, I find it odd that on that side of thing, with, with the, with the, fir- with the previous dress, he's obviously a definitive no to that, which I assume is the fact that it was too revealing. That for him to then be fine with the next one, which obviously isn't the dress, is, is an odd cut, but I guess it's... Maybe it's it just looked classier. Comedy. Yeah. So then she comes back out with another one. She says, this one, he says, not bad. And we cut, and she says, this one to a pretty much identical dress. I haven't tried to tell the difference. And he says, it's a trick question. Isn't it the same dress? She says, no, which Tim is surprised by. And then she comes out with another one and says, okay, I don't think this one's too bad. Uh, he says, yes, yeah, it's fabulous. And it's obviously a very glittery dress, which, Considering the cir- circumstance she's in, yeah, it's it's just it's it's a it's odd that she even laid that dress out for what is supposedly an important meeting more than anything. <laughs> and she says, "Really? Yeah, okay." And that's where ninety three concludes. Um, and I guess we could slide straight into ninety four. I mean, have you got anything particularly on the visuals in this minute? Because it's obviously mostly just shot reverse shot. Yeah, a lot of reverse shot. I think you know you've got low key lighting. You've got. It. <laughs> One of the things that I thought when I was rewatching this scene is you've got a man sat there who is torn between being downstairs with the kids and being with his very attractive wife watching her get changed over and over and over again and, and, you know, just wants her to sort this out. But then in the room again, you've got very, very warm colours. You've got low key lighting. The lamp on the side offers just enough light that it's a very, it's a room that you can imagine was very romantic for them where yeah. they would have been all over each other prior to kids and now it's let's have a discussion about function so that I kind of picked up on and I think the other thing I picked up on is I had to watch it twice to see whether we ever saw her reflection in the mirror because Not in directly. the first part we don't and I don't think we see her reflection in the mirror despite its positioning there until it's the heels and the dwarf comment and we see the side profile as she steps back a little bit. But again, I thought that was quite interesting because mirrors in a scene are very often used in a much kind of trickier or, or I don't know, trying to be too clever with the shot. And actually, it it was it served a function as a prop. That's what they're there for. I get to see me in it, but the audience doesn't get to see me in it because it's not from her perspective. So I, they were the only things really there that I... I would pick up on from it. Yeah, a I visual. think whenever you've got whenever you've got a mirror in a scene, you know that whatever you see in that mirror is deliberate because mirrors are such a pain to work with. Yeah. 
I filmed with a mirror once, and it was really annoying. So, so yeah, I think you only really have mirrors when they're there to serve a purpose, as you said. Anything on visuals, Robert, in your opinion, before we slide straight into 94? I won't nitpick the dresses, but I love, but by the end of the minute, he's, when he's, she says, he says, yeah, it's fabulous. She says, really? He has no idea what he's talking about anymore. He's lost. Yeah. He's he looks lost more disheveled, interest entirely. He? And he's lost the will to uh, live. And, and I would note that this, <laughs> this bedroom, unlike hers at the old apartment, looks like it was decorated by a sane person. <laughs> It's a much more gender neutral, like, like they've negotiated it in there. Yeah, and, and, and it's simpler. It doesn't have different designs mm. on every surface. And mismatched blankets and wallpaper, pillows. Um, so Robert, with 94, I'm confused by your first comment on 94. <laughs> you would be. <laughs> yeah. I assume it's... It's, so is, is this what would be an ad break? No, it's an, it's an in-joke no, okay. that I have, uh, when people ask me, because we'll say the first line of 94. It's it's Mary. She says, great, good. Um, How about the blue one? Which was the first dress she tried on. There was a commercial. I don't even remember what it was for, so I couldn't find it. Uh, it's like late 90s, early 2000s, where this guy, it's a similar setup. A guy is watching his wife try dresses. Or she like holds up two dresses, and he just says the blue one. And I think the joke was that she wasn't even holding a blue one. And so when people, ever since then, when someone would ask me like two options between two things, I'd be like, just pick the blue one. <laughs> Didn't matter what they were holding up. They could be holding up chips. Or like drinks, I'm like pick the blue one. Thing is, the, the reason I, I was confused, I because the amount of detail going to in your notes, I thought you'd figured out that this was like an ad break <laughs> <laughs> whenever, the, whenever, the, whenever, as because yeah, I mean, you, you you might have noticed even from this that the the amount of effort Robert puts into his notes compared to me, like you know he he'll work out. We don't have as much here, but you know you'll work out the location of pretty much. I still haven't found where their house out. is, and it's bugging me. They've only showed the uh, the front door, not the street. It's, uh. <laughs> It is impressive, and yeah, I, I mean, I, I've told before that I tested Robert's Google Maps skills at one point by just sending him a picture of the front of my house, and he found it within like two hours. It was, well, I, I know that involved were, also going through my face. A couple minutes ago, when they were walking with the kids, I found that that was the location it was because there's a number on the sign which is a parking zone, and so I looked up what where that parking zone was in London, and then checked the street view to see if it was the right place. And it was. If there are signs or numbers, I'm going to look them up. <laughs> yes, he says, how about the blue one? Tim says, uh, blue one? <laughs> yeah. The first one that you tried on that was boring and lumpy, but that actually wasn't boring and lumpy, that one. She says, yeah, which do you prefer? <clears throat> I don't know, I'm actually starting to go mad. And for some reason, whenever he says that line, he reminds me of Matt Smith, and it makes me think about how good Donal would be as the Doctor. But we want Rachel as the Doctor. Yeah, we, we, we do. We've talked about this. Uh, Ra- Rachel would be a, a better doctor, but I think Donal would be a, a Matt Smith-esque doctor. Yeah. I don't know what it is about his delivery of starting to go mad that just always reminds me of Matt Smith. Like, do you know what I mean at all, Robert? Yeah, 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 I do. I, do. I, do. <laughs> I mean, I, I like that bit. And that's the only bit in the, in the clips that we've discussed last episode and this one where, again, I watched it two or three times to try and make a decision as to whether it's overplayed or not. And, I kind of again. I, I think it would be if she reacted yes, to it. Yes, absolutely. And but it's like she doesn't even care that he said it. There's she just balance, isn't there? It, it's kind of, yeah. but you need that edge because actually, as function in humans in life, we have those moments where we're essentially just talking to ourselves out loud, and we are losing the plot, and that's what you see. But yeah, I, I really, really like that moment from him, and I think it kind of. She's so calm at that point, and he's. So not that the how it now progresses is uh, is nice for the older, really nerdy people in the audience. I would remind you of the issue of X Factor, where Quicksilver has to go to the therapist, and he talks about how his life is constantly so fast that just waiting in line to order food is a nightmare to him. And that's how I picture Tim's brain is working right now. It's like he can time travel. He doesn't want to sit in a chair and do nothing. Mm. Yeah, and I think, as we've said before, like, the placement of this scene is really important. Because we're going from two really, you know, going from one mm-hmm. more yeah, upsetting moment to the next. we jump forward and this is where, this is like a reset. Um, he says, it's time to go mad. She says, okay, I think I like the blue one. He says, okay, yeah. Okay, okay, let's go with this one then. She says, wearing the blue one. And Tim says, you look amazing. Really? Yes. Okay, thanks. And where's Posey? I left her downstairs. Not leaving the door open to the room with the manuscript in it. So, yeah, I mean, 
the, the, the question here is, what, what, I, I didn't check actually, the room with the manuscript in it, mm-hmm. is that the room that they were in beforehand then? No. Tim and Posey were. No, I assume so it's some actually, sort of office space from the look of it. So actually, there. Mary left the door open to the room with the manuscript in. Tim just didn't Potentially, close it. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I love, I love here that you have that kind of, as the audience, you have this final breath of relief. And all the tension just comes down slightly, like a, a balloon deflating, but it feels good. And he has this expression on his face, which is, I'm shattered and I'm tired, but I did good, didn't I? And, and then it all goes horribly <laughs> wrong from there. And I, I think that's well, beautiful. It's great, too. When he says you look amazing, he's standing already. Like, he's he, she's settled. We're accepting this. She's not. She doesn't get to leave the room and try another one anymore. Yeah. I think we've all had days like this mm. as well. Where as soon as one thing's settled, the next one comes. Well, some, quite often the first thing doesn't settle. Yeah. <laughs> no, before the next you're thing still dealing up. with the first one while the second one pops its head. Ugh. Mm. And so, yeah, we go, we, we smash cut into Mary closing the door on the office. And she says, look at me, look at me in the eye and talk me through this. Well, basically, my life is over. Okay? I just need to go out for like, just like two minutes. <laughs> Maybe one. Don't you dare. Okay, I'm just, don't you dare. Uh, don't you dare answer that as the, as the phone is ringing. What am I going to do? He says, I think we really should answer the phone. <laughs> if you answer the, and, that, you know, that's it. That's the damn phone. And we leave there. Well, it doesn't say phone at the end of this point, but I think it's, yeah, I mean, I, I, I like that he can't even get out, get away with leaving at this point to go back in time. I think it's, it's nice that even here, there are some points which he just mm. has to live. And he can't escape. And, you know, he's had that relief and event, yes, I can now go and it's all sorted to, I am now trapped. And I, I love the fact that she actually closes the door behind. That's a proper mum moment. I am not going to do yeah. this in front of the kids. Yeah, she traps I'm going to dress you down, get behind that door and get in here now. The kind of hushed voice and that slightly, you know, making yourself two inches shorter like a witch as you point and say, look me in the eyes. <laughs> um, you know, and I, I've seen myself do that. How you watch the film, I can, if I'm doing it, I think I don't look that good when I do it. I actually look like the witch out of the Snow White first animation. But yeah, that closing of the door really signals that we're going to deal with this. We're going to deal with it now. And as the audience, you're trapped in there with them. You don't get to escape the uncomfortable situation either. And I like that she doesn't just look angry. You can see the upset and panic as well of the as well as the anger, which I think is just because I don't know. I feel I feel like you could she could have just played it as over the top angry, but the fact that you can see that she's she is not just angry at Tim, but she's worried and concerned about what's happening as a result of it, which is just lovely, lovely performance. And I do like how we do leave the phone ringing for a while. Mm. I think the phone we come to in in the next kind of minute. Um, but I think that their tone of voice and facial expression and combine that with there's quite a few over the shoulder shots and, and how that switch and how it's edited, it betrays the calm because she's trying to keep her mm-hmm. voice calm and he's trying to keep yep. his voice calm. And they're both doing that false calm thing that slowly raises and raises and raises. And as we go into the next minute and that phone just keeps pushing and going, that really makes that extra sensory overload unbearable. But I think the performance there is um, really, really nice with how it's been shot because we all do that. We try and stay calm. We, we, we're going to keep a lid on this and it's all going to be okay. It's like trying to internally reassure yourself whilst having a go at somebody. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess one of the questions is, she's about to go off to the this meeting and she hasn't finished reading the manuscript. Well, she may have read um, it, which she I just guess, has it. Yeah. So, I, I assume, does she have to bring it with her? I mean, I, I guess maybe she's got notes on it or stuff. It. Yeah. Okay. And I, I obviously we see in 95 how quickly stresses can be thrown into perspective with the next thing to follow. But have we got any concluding thoughts well, on that? I think we should mention... Because it, just in case the person listening is, hasn't watched the movie recently, the damage that has been done. Because the the paper shredder is knocked over, the manuscript is partly shredded. There's a sippy cup that's lit off, laying on a pile of pages. There's a stuffed animal that got left behind, which is funny. And then there's blue scribbles with crayons on a bunch of the pages. It's a mess. 
And you know that that's really important because neither character at this point is central in the frame. So if we look at it as rule of thirds, you know, we are looking at that chaos is the only thing that stays center that that shot is in the middle. Yeah, I like that shot. This is what it centers around. Goes across the wreckage as they're still talking already. And I would note it's it's funny to me if you think about this like more on the time travel side. Tim has no reason to rush. He doesn't need to fix this immediately. He can fix it tomorrow. Like, he just has to deal with the chaos of her yelling at him or getting mad or anything that's going to come, and then he can fix it. So I think a how quickly she is to tell him no, he can't leave, and b how yeah how much he wants to rush it. I think he's got out of a lot of arguments yeah. through this, and she's realised. <laughs> He, he leaves. Well, except she shouldn't remember no, him she ever leaving. She wouldn't remember, good point. But she probably knows that he runs away a lot. She just doesn't know why. And now he's running away from her. That's not good. I, I'd, I'd love her to catch him walking out of a cupboard at some point. Well, I mean, he I know has to. Back in time. I, I would imagine yeah. he has. he's in the cupboard a lot if they've been together. Yeah. It'd be, I mean, as I said, there's... I, I think it's great with a film like this that there are so many things that we could imagine. There's so many other stories that could, should be told here. I, I kept saying during the, the wedding scene that because there were so many relatives there, it would have been great if when Tim went up to the cupboard, someone yeah. else walked out or something like that. But yeah, if we any other thoughts on 94 before we wrap up this Wednesday? No. So, Kate, where can the listeners find you on social media? On Twitter at TeacherGeek101 or on Instagram at CatSminch. Okay. And Robert, where can they find you? Robert E.G. Black on all social media, I think. And then lemmingdrops.com to find links. And the listeners can find me on Twitter at llama underscore bottle zero, on Instagram at Ginger Luke, on Facebook at Luke Allen Film, all podcasts, radio appearances, newspaper articles, short films, anything I'm remotely involved in is probably at lukeallen.co.uk. This podcast can be found on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Two Mins About Time, and they can join our Facebook group, The Cupboard, to discuss all things to do with About Time and the show and all the tangents we have can all be discussed there. Today's goodbye, once again, is from a random article I find on the internet. It's a different one this time. What's the website called? This is from stylecraze.com, and it, it fare thee well. I can't believe we haven't done fare thee well, have we? Which is weird. I thought we would have done that one. Fare thee well. The Two Minutes About Time theme is performed by Ethan O'Mahony and is a cover of the About Time theme originally composed by Nick Laird Close. Two Minutes About Time is a production of Lemming Drop Studios in association with Bottle O Productions. Mm-hmm.